right, take your Bible this evening if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, make sure I see you after service, Steve, okay? You're not in trouble or anything, just make sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's leaving now, all right. you better, you better stay there, all right? All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> Verse 1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this, that is, in other words, this tabernacle we're in now, we groan. How many relate to that? Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now here's our text for tonight. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Be accepted of Him. Father, add your blessing. Uh, to the scripture reading here this evening. And Lord, as we open up your word now and we look at this important truth of whether we will be accepted of you. And Lord, help us to understand what that means and to uh, glean the truth you have for us tonight. May it help us, may it challenge us, may it encourage us tonight to live as you would desire us to live. Lord, bless the study of your word now in Jesus' name, amen. We, let me, let me distinguish something as we look at this. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, now here it says, we labor that we may be accepted of him. You say, I thought we were accepted of him because of what Jesus Christ has done. I want you to hold your finger there or put a piece of paper in 2 Corinthians 5. And I want you to go to your right just a little bit. Right after 2 Corinthians is the book of Galatians. Right after Galatians is the book of Ephesians. And I want you to get Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1 teaches us something here. If you notice with me, Ephesians 1, notice verse number 5. If you're there, you say amen. amen. Okay, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us, what? Accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in Christ. We are accepted in the beloved. Not of him, but in him. And we are accepted in him, by Jesus Christ and what He has done for us. In Christ is our standing before God. When God looks at you, if you know Christ is your Savior tonight, when He looks at you, He doesn't see you, He sees Jesus Christ. He doesn't see your righteousness, which is filthy rags. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And uh, it, we're, we go to heaven not on what we've done, but based on what Jesus has done. And so we are dressed in His righteousness alone, and, and His righteousness has been imputed to us. Look back to your left now to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You find out that Jesus Christ, being accepted in Christ, is my standing before God. And in Christ, Jesus Christ is made, we sing the song, Jesus Christ is made to me, all I need, all I need. Okay, here's, here's where part of that comes from is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice verse number 30. But of him are ye 
in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're in Christ, you're a Christian. You're saved. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Okay? So you have been born again because you're in Christ. Now it says, if you're uh, of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us, so Jesus is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now he's made all those things us. In fact, he's not just those things. He's everything to you and me. That's why the next verse says, as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Because there's nothing we have to glory in ourselves. It's all because of Jesus Christ. So he is our perfection. He is our redemption. He, it, we are complete in Him. When, when, when you're complete, you have everything. If I say you have 100% of something, how much of it do you have? All of it, okay? And so we are, have 100% in Christ. We've been accepted in the Beloved. Accepted in Christ. That's a standing that all believers have in Christ before God okay now to be accepted of him is a different thing altogether that's what Paul's referring to here in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 and we're going to look at some other scriptures so get your Bible ready and what he's talking about here has to do with our present state it has to do with how we live our lives whether we are accepted of him are you ambitious to be accepted of Him? Do you desire to be accepted of Him? You are, in, you are in Christ and accepted in the Beloved, but here Paul is talking about something different. He's talking about us laboring, that whether present or absent, we can be accepted of Him. Notice Romans 12 Verses 1 and 2. These are familiar to you, but I think you ought to see it and uh, listen carefully as we read the verses. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. What's the next word? Acceptable. There's that word. Unto God, which is your reasonable service. You understand? Here it is presenting our bodies a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable unto God. That's our reasonable service. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, we'll come back and, and address that in just a moment. Now, keep going to your right in your Bible to Romans 14. Romans 14 is about uh, some that eat certain things and some that don't eat certain things, some that observe certain days, others won't observe certain days. And uh, Paul is writing to them. He says the important thing is, verse number 12, every one of us will give account of himself to God. Don't let us therefore not, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So he's saying, I don't want to be a cause of stumbling to someone else. Now, he says, verse 16, Let not your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. What is the kingdom of God? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So that's the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So is that, is that he telling you seek first what you eat or what you drink? No. He's saying, seek righteousness, seek peace, seek joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. So we find out here, we can, we can, if, we're, if we're realizing the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, and we're seeking that, that is acceptable to God. All right, keep moving. Ephesians chapter 5. Keep going to your right. Past 2 Corinthians, Galatians, back to Ephesians chapter 5. This is a familiar 
verse to most of you. Chapter 5, talking about being followers of God as dear children and how to walk in love and how to walk in the light. In verse number 8, is walk as children of light. And he says in verse number 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. So we're proving what is acceptable to God so that we could be accepted to Him and by Him. Now, look at Philippians chapter 4. Just keep right on going to your right. Try to put these in order so we can easily just keep going and keep turning to them. Notice what he says here in Philippians 4 about Epaphroditus and the gift to the church at Philippi sent him. Paul said, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable well-pleasing to God. Paul said here, here it was a matter of their giving. The church gave to Paul, and Paul said, you know what? God accepted that. That's, that was well-pleasing in his sight. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. On our, on our prayer list, we have the leadership in our country and the leadership in our state, the leadership on our local level. Why is that? Because of 1 Timothy 2. Notice the scripture says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. Well, why would we do that? Why would we pray for those people in authority? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Okay? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Okay, Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is, has to do with children caring for their parents. This is a widow. Verse 4, well, he says in verse 3, Honor widows that are widows indeed, but if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home. And to requite their parents. Requite means to return an equivalent good. So, in other words, they did good to you when you weren't able to care for yourself. You returned that favor when they can't take care of themselves. Okay? And he says, when you do that, what did God say at the end of that passage? That is good and acceptable before God. Over and over again. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. He tells us first two about uh, uh, newborn babes desiring to see milk of the word that we can grow. And he says in verse 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So we offer up spiritual sacrifices and, and not, just, not just any kind of a sacrifice, but we have to offer up a spiritual sacrifice that will be accepted by God. Do you understand? All these things that are accepted by Him, we understand then there must be some things that are not accepted by Him. Makes sense, doesn't it? That, that would not be okay with Him. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Go down to verse number 20. Here Peter writes, For what glory is it when ye are buffeted for your faults? Ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, and ye take it patiently, this is, what church? Acceptable with God. So we, we find over and over, most of you know Psalm 19, 14, Let the words of my mouth and, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So whether it's the body of the living sacrifice, whether it's not being a stumbling block, whether it's giving to the Lord's work, whether it's praying for authority, whether it's children caring for elderly parents, whether it's spiritual sacrifices, whether it's suffering, whether it's the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart, we're doing all of that for one reason, to be acceptable to God, to be acceptable to God, for God to receive that. Now, the key word, obviously, is accepted, okay? And what, what I think our trouble is, 
is the way the word is used in the Bible is not the way we use it today. Teachers. Any, any, we have any teachers in here? Hmm? Anybody will admit it? Okay. You, you taught school, you homeschooled, whatever you taught. Okay. If the, if, if the children turn a paper in, Mrs. Yoder taught for years. Student turns a paper and you say, well, I guess this is acceptable. Does that mean it's a good paper? No. See, it means I'll, I'll take it, but it's not really what I wanted for it, and it's probably not your best work. That's kind of how we handle the word acceptable. Okay? But that's not the way the Bible is the word acceptable. That's, uh, well, our, uh, we've deteriorated so far in our language. But it's in, in the 1828 dictionary, here's what it is, acceptable. That may be received with pleasure. Hence, pleasing to the receiver, gratifying. So here, God is saying, uh, in other words, these things that are acceptable are things that I would receive with pleasure. I will receive it with pleasure. So when I present my body a living sacrifice, holy unto God, God says I receive that with pleasure. When I, when I don't conform to the world, but I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind, that I can prove not, not what is the good will of God and the perfect will of God, and then, well, okay, I'll accept it. No, no, that's not what acceptable there means. It means I will, I will receive that. You're not conforming, but you're transforming by your mind. I'll receive that with pleasure. I will gladly receive that. I'm gratified with that. When you suffer in pain and you endure it patiently, God says, I receive that with pleasure. When you, when you take care of your parents, when you requite their parents, uh, I take that with great pleasure. When you pray for kings and for all that are in authority, God says, I receive that with great pleasure. You see, that's what he's referring to when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we are going to be accepted of him. I want, to, I want that my labor, notice what he says, we're laboring. My, our works that we do to be joyfully received by Him. Pleasing to Him. You see, 1 Corinthians, go back here in 2 Corinthians 5, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You remember the verse in Romans we read a minute ago? So then every one of us will give account of himself to God. Okay, you familiar with that verse? That's talking about a judgment. Okay, there is a judgment that all of us as believers will have when we stand before God. There are two, two judgments. There's a judgment of believers and there's a judgment of unbelievers. We are not all together at one big judgment. Okay, at the judgment of the unbelievers in Revelation chapter 20, the Bible talks about that they stood before a great white throne. That's why it's called the great white throne judgment. Okay, uh, and that is only lost people there. Okay, They'll be, their names are not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life and they're cast into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. There's, there's no, no, uh, no, nobody saved that is at that judgment. We may witness that judgment, I don't know. We may see people there who maybe we should have witnessed to or maybe our loved ones there, I don't know. Maybe it's sometime, maybe it's sometime after that God will wipe away our tears. It's sometime after that that God will take away the former things and we won't remember them anymore. But, but that's, the, that's the unsaved. The saved is at the, what's called the judgment seat of Christ or the bema seat of Christ. And so uh, that's what 1 Corinthians 3 is talking about. Notice verse number 9. We are laborers together with God. We're in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon. Here it is. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, or thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay? When you receive Christ your Savior, it's like a foundation is laid for your life. Okay? You have the foundation. And boy, there's no other foundation you can build on. In fact, Jesus in Matthew 7 taught, if you build on any other kind of foundation, it's simply sinking what? Sand. It won't hold up. 
your life at some point will crumble. The storms come, the waves beat, the winds blow, and your house will fall. So you have to have the foundation of Jesus Christ. And that's the, that's the only foundation. Now, we're all building on that foundation. Okay, Christianity is not a spectator religion. Okay? It's not it is it is a participant it is a participating faith. You're you're not saved. Nobody's saved to sit. You're saved to serve. Everybody is saved to serve. You you haven't served. I'm I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you sit and take up 18 or more inches of a seat. I'm happy about that. I'm pleased with that. But God's not pleased when all you do is occupy a seat. Okay? You're to be serving Him with your life. You're to be building. Okay? It's, it's, the, it's the parable of the, the talents when He gave one fella five, another fella two, another fella one. Hey, everybody got something. And everybody has different levels of abilities that God has gifted us. Okay? But the thing is, the five went out and traded and got five more. And remember what Jesus said to him? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. The fellow got two. He went out and got two more. God didn't expect him to get ten. He just got two and got two more. He got the exact same commendation. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But the third guy who got one, he didn't get a commendation, did he? Why not? Yeah, he just went out and hit it. He'd, in, in our day, you know what he would have done? He just brought it to church and sat on it. He just sat in his chair and let it stay there. Okay? Don't be that guy. All right? Be the one that builds. Be the one that, that does something with his life. Notice now here what, what we have. Now, if any man, verse 12, build upon this foundation... Gold, silver, precious stones. Wood, hay, stubble. So there's, so there's two different types of building materials we have. We have gold, silver, and we have precious stones. And then we have wood, hay, and stubble. Okay? Now, I, I, we shouldn't have to ask, should we? Which, which set of three would you like to build with? Okay? Now, you may have some doubt. Say, well, I kind of like wood frame houses. You know, that's okay. I'll take some wood. And that may be all right. But wait a minute. What if I tell you that we're going to test what you build with fire? Now, which set would you like to use? I think we'd like the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. That'll hold up under fire pretty good. Notice what the Lord says. Every man's work. Every man's what, church? Work. Are we talking about a man's salvation? No, we're talking about his works for the Lord. Whether we labor, we labor, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Okay? So, he says, we work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of how much it is. Nobody's listening. One, one guy's listening. Bob Wallace heard it. Oh, it's not of how much it is. No, it's every man's work of what sort it is. Not how much of it there is, but what kind of it is it. The quality of that is going to be tested. And if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Sounds like it'll be accepted. Sounds like it'll bring God pleasure. He's going to reward you. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Ah, oh, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Saved, but singed. Okay? Saved, but no eyebrows, you know? <laughs> Accepted by him. Now, here's the, here's the question, isn't it? If that's the judgment... And, and this is the, the clearest probably passage in the New Testament regarding the judgment seat, then 
how can we make sure that what we're doing, that our labor, that our works for God as believers will be gold, silver, and precious stones and not the wood, hay, and the stubble. I'm going to give you four, four ways to ensure that, that we will build with the proper ingredients. And then our work then, our labors are accepted. They're gratefully received. They're, they're, they're pleasurably received by the Lord. Number one, we must work lovingly. We must work lovingly. Or I, I must labor lovingly. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. You're in 1 Corinthians 3. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is the great charity chapter. Charity is just a, I, I think, the highest form of love that there is. That uh, you, you can't surpass charity. And I want you to notice <coughs> what, what the Apostle Paul says here about charity or about love. He says, though I speak, look at this now. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. How many, how many are aware of people today that think it's a pretty big thing that they can talk with the tongue of angels? Or the, 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 the maybe other languages of even men. And that makes them feel pretty important. Notice what Paul said. And by the way, Paul, Paul could speak at least five different languages. That's why he told the church of Corinth, he said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. He wasn't talking about an unknown language. He's talking about I can speak five different languages and I could put you under the table. Okay? And so he says, but if I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I don't have that, that utmost love, I'm become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains. Man, if you just stop there and say, man, what a guy. He can prophesy. He knows everything. He has great faith. I've seen him move mountains. Man, give him a TV program. Do something. But what does he say? If I don't have charity, I am what? Nothing. Nothing at all. How important is it to do what we do lovingly? How important is it that we, whatever labor it is, be done out of love? The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, your mind, all your strength. The second's like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's all about love. But wait. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, I could be a martyr. And it wouldn't count if I don't do it out of charity. If I don't do it out of love. It profiteth me nothing. Wow. The highest expression of love. Everything I do, everything you do, we're to do because we love Jesus Christ. Period. That's all. Nothing more, nothing less. Don't serve because people expect you to. Don't serve because you want to look good in someone else's eyes. Don't serve just because you feel like you have to. Don't serve because you want to be recognized or rewarded by people? Serve because you love Jesus Christ. Oh, you can serve to be recognized. You can serve to be impressive by other people. You, you can do all those things, but it'll be wood, hay, and stubble. It will not be received with pleasure by God. It will count for nothing. It will profit you nothing. Your work won't abide. It won't abide. A young man had gotten out of the service and made shore in San Diego, California. He made a long-distance call to New York City to his parents, and 
They were so pleased to hear from him, they had not heard from him in several months. He said, I'm coming home, but I need to bring a friend with me. Is that okay? And he said, well, absolutely. Son, we'd be glad to have you bring a friend home. And he said, well, now wait a minute, Dad. He said, my friend's had some trouble. He, he lost one arm and the other's paralyzed and he lost an eye. Just the tragedies of war. He said, son, of course, bring him home. He can stay. He can stay for a few days. He said, I, we wouldn't necessarily want someone like that around for too long, but two or three days will be fine. They hung up. And two days later, they got another phone call that their son had committed suicide in a motel in San Diego. When they flew out to identify their son's body, you know what they saw. They saw a son without an arm and missing an eye. You see, the parents were not motivated by love not motivated by love. Whatever we do, if it's going to be gold, silver, and precious stones, it must be motivated by love. It cannot be motivated by anything else. So we have to do it by love. The second thing, I think the second way we can make sure we have gold, silver, and precious stones is we have to work willingly. We have to labor or serve willingly. Over and over again in the Old Testament, we could go to numerous scriptures, but when you remember the offering they took for the tabernacle in Exodus 25, the only time in the Bible where, uh, uh, you know, Moses, as a preacher, had to get up and say, stop giving. We've got enough and we've got way over what we need. That's never happened again in the history of the church, I'll guarantee you that. And words you'll never hear from this pulpit, all right? But... um. It, it certainly was then. But, you know, the Bible says that, that every man gave willingly with his heart for the offering. Nobody, nobody forced anybody to give. Nobody felt obligated to give. They gave out of love. And they gave willingly. Same thing happened when they built the temple. It, it talks about how with a perfect heart, in First Chronicles 29, verse 9, and, and that with a perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David rejoiced with great joy. Proverbs 31, the Proverbs 31 woman. She worketh willingly with her hands. She willingly is what wants to work. Not like, all right, I'll do my mother thing and get this lunch for you. You see, it, it was always willing. Always with a good spirit. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 17, if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Paul said, I, I don't want to just do it because I have to. I want to do it because I want to. I want to be willing to do his will. And then 1 Peter 5, 2 talks about the, the, the pastor. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Pastor ought to want to pass to the church willingly, not against his will. I don't think the you know the pastor who says, well, I, you know, didn't wasn't anything else I could do, so I guess I'd pastor. Huh? No, 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 no. It shouldn't be like you. But God backed me in a corner, and I had no choice. No, no. You ought to want to do it willingly. You know, First Peter three says, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Sounds willing to me. And so be willing. And the pastor needs to be willing. Willingly means without reluctance. Willingly means cheerfully. By your own choice. It means we come to church willingly. Without reluctance. Cheerfully. By our own choice. I know some of the kids are sitting here and saying, I didn't have a choice. That's okay. Thank God mom and dad did. But what you do in the church, you ought to do willingly, cheerfully, usher, sing, clean the building, work the nursery, 
shouldn't have to put your arm on you. Come on. Take, take a turn in the nursery. Oh, man. One time. One time. Maybe, maybe other times when we're hard-pressed for workers, we'll just empty the nursery out and have them come in here and let's see what kind of a church service we'll have. It'd be rough. Pray willingly. Teach willingly. Sing willingly. Make such a difference whether you have to or you want to. You get to. See, it's just a matter of your spirit. Will I, will I say I want to do this I, without reluctance? cheerfully how great it is i, I read the story about the, uh, a group of people who got concerned about the pastor because he would disappear every morning and and didn't tell anybody where he was going and nobody knew where he went and they were really concerned about him and so a couple of deacons got together and decided they're going to follow the pastor and he, they watched him leave his office, get in his car and drove out to the edge of the town where there's some woods and then he started walking out through the woods they parked their car and they followed the pastor out there. And they followed him out to where there was a little opening and the train tracks came by and he watched as a train went by. And the pastor just stood there hooping and hollering. Woo! Ha ha ha! Go, man, go! And they couldn't wait. They thought he lost his mind. And they said, what are you doing, pastor? And he was kind of startled to see him, but he said, I just get excited about seeing something move without me having to push it. You know how great it is to go talk to somebody about, hey, we need this done. And they say, sure, pastor, I'd be happy to do that. I'm like, oh, wait a minute, let me get a nitroglycerin. Huh? Yeah, it'd be great. Oh, for people just to serve willingly. Paul said, I want to do it, and I've got a dispensation of the gospel committed to me, but I'm going to take this thing willingly, not against my will. Do you serve willingly? If you don't, listen, God, God will take it begrudgingly, just like, you know, you give. He loves a cheerful giver. He'll take it from a grouch. But you'll lose. You, you, it'll be wood, hay, and stubble. It won't be gold, silver, precious stone. It won't be uh, pleasurably received by him. But our service will be pleasurably received by him when we do it lovingly, when we do it willingly. Number three. Number three, we have to do it unselfishly. That means we're serving without wanting anything for ourselves. Can you really give and not expect to receive? Can you, can you, do, do you come to church for what you get or for what you give? We become very self-oriented. What's in it for me? And we carry that attitude into the church. And you find out when, when a new family comes to town and they visit churches, you know what it's all about? Well, this church says they can give me this, this, and this, and this church gives me this, this, and this. What, what does your church offer me? And that's that. In other words, it, it's not, well, what are some areas we could serve the Lord in your church? How could, we, how could we serve God? If we became members of your church, how could we serve and be a blessing there? See? What am I getting? We want, well, do you, you, know, do you have a class for men over 50 that are balding and left-handed? You know, we, we, it, 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 everybody wants their specialty class that if I can be in a group with everybody just like me. Because again, consumer mentality. Give me what I want. You know what we're here to do? We're here to learn God's Word. And then put it into practice. It's not rocket science. Okay? And, and, and it's a good deal, by the way. I, I, think, I think we've done a great disservice to our families when every time we come to church... We break them all up. We preach family, family, family. Then you come to church and everybody goes a different direction. There, that's why I, I kind of like summer when we're all here. This Sunday for All-American Sunday, there's no children's church. We're all going to stay in here together. Good, good service, patriotic service. Our kids ought to be here for that. Okay? 
Every now and then, they just ought to learn how to behave in church. I, 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 when I was younger, they never heard of children's church. It shows you how old I am. Eh? Sit there in church, and boy, Miss Babe, Dad, flick that ear or grab that ear, buddy. And you knew you better straighten up, or you were going to get it. How can I serve in the church? Where can I help in the church? <clears throat> the story is told of William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army. He had lost his eyesight, and his son, Bramwell, was given the task of telling the father that there'd be no recovery. He would, he's not going to be able to see again. And the general asked, do you mean that I'm blind? His son said, I hear that we must contemplate that. The father continued, you mean I'll, I shall never see your face again? And his son said, no, probably not in this world. Bramwell, said General Booth, I have done what I could for God and for his people with my eyes. Now I shall do what I can for God without my eyes. That's unselfish service. In the summer of 1986, two ships collided in the Black Sea off the coast of Russia. Hundreds of people died as they were hurled into the icy waters. And, and the news got worse as they investigated the cause of the accident. It wasn't a technology problem. It wasn't a radar malfunction. It wasn't even thick fog. The cause was human stubbornness. Each captain was aware of the other ship's presence nearby. Both could have steered clear, but neither captain would give way to the other. Each was too proud to be the first to yield and be unselfish. And by the time they came to their senses, it was too late. And hundreds died. I wonder how many collisions there's been in churches because of selfishness, pride, people unwilling to be the first to yield, and how many people have been hurt because of that. You have to serve unselfishly. Be willing, as Jesus did, to take the towel and wash somebody's feet if that's what it takes. See, So we serve lovingly, we serve willingly, we serve unselfishly, and the last one, I believe, if we'll, we'll do this, we'll have the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. And we'll be pleasurably received. Our works will be joyfully received by God. And that is, we must work and serve faithfully. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. You consider it a good worker if you go to work when you feel like it? John Coleman, you, you had a record, you had kind of a streak at work of not missing a day, didn't you? Fourteen years and never missed one day of work. Feel like going every day, 14 years? You really got up, felt great every time? Never felt bad? Yeah, how long? <laughs> yeah, Carol shaking her head, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I know, he's never sick, huh? Until <laughs> he retired and he got sick. Boy, I don't know what that says, but I look out. You had a good record too, didn't you, Carol? 34 and a half years, and you never missed a day of work? Oh, okay. All right. I was going to say, wow, that's really good. How many ever gone to work and you didn't feel like going to work? I know, I know, I owe, I owe, so off the work I go. I understand. <laughs> I, I, get, I get that, okay? But we know that if we're going to be a good employee, there's days we're going to have to go and do the job and do our work when we don't feel like doing it, okay? Now, if that makes you a good employee, why is it that we think that, well, I don't have to go to church tonight, I don't feel like going? and yet still think I'm a good Christian. I can't tell you how many times 
when people miss church and they talk to me. Now, Pastor, I know I haven't been there, but I want you to know I, I'm still doing good. Why do you have to convince me of that? See? Faithfully. Faithfully. Well done, now good and faithful servant. That means you're going to have to come to church when you don't feel like it. That means you're going to have to read your Bible when you don't feel like reading your Bible. It means you're going to have to go to prayer when you don't feel like going to prayer. Sometimes you're going to have to witness and give someone a track and uh, follow the prompting of the Lord when you don't feel like doing that. If you're going to be faithful. When a very slow-moving clerk in a small store was not around one morning, the customer asked the owner's son, where's Eddie? Is he sick? Nope. Well, what's wrong with him? He ain't working here no more. Oh. Oh. Customer said, do you have anybody in mind to fill his vacancy? And the fellow said, no, Eddie didn't leave no vacancy. Don't be that kind of a worker where you leave and nobody says, well, there, who filled his spot? There wasn't any spot to fill. I'd much rather say, well, we had to hire three people when they left. That's, that's a better testimony. Like they had to do at Sigma when Bob Wallace retired. I think that's true. I know pretty close. At least that's what I heard. <laughs> From Bob. No, I'm kidding. It wasn't Bob. <laughs> <laughs> the command of God is to be faithful. The call of God is to be faithful. Be dependable. Be reliable. I've told you this before. Grew up at Canton Baptist Temple in Canton, Ohio. And, you know, in the years we went there, uh, the pastor never visited us one time. He came, he came to us one time when my grandpa died. And he came over to our house. He didn't, and, and you say, well, what, you upset the pastor never came to see you? No. I came to see him three times a week. I saw him Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. He didn't want to see me any other time. And he knew we were okay. I don't know. But your brother Yoder, you grew up in Camp Beth's Temple. Pastor Anniger came and visited you every week probably, right? No. Why? Yoders were always there to see him. See? Faithful. Faithful. How many years was your dad in the, he was a junior Sunday school department? Junior one? How many years? Ten years? How many years? Did he teach up there before he became superintendent? Do you know? Of high school? How many years did your dad serve in the church? All your life, huh? Yeah. All his life. Faithfulness. If living the Christian life is important, then faithfulness is important. I love what he said about Gaius in 3 John. Verse 5. You know what he said? Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. Gaius, you do what you do faithfully, whether it's to Christians or to non Christian people you even know. You're faithful in everything you do. I don't know about you. I want to be accepted of him. I want to labor so that I can be accepted of Him. I want the, the works that I build to be gold, silver, and precious stones. So they can be joyfully received. Pleasurably received. I have no desire to see everything burn up. And I embarrassingly, embarrassingly get into heaven. Saved but singed. Hmm? I want to be accepted of Him. Let's serve lovingly. Let's serve willingly. Let's serve unselfishly. Let's serve faithfully. And we'll be accepted of Him. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the plainness of your word. 
Thank you, Father, for the privilege to serve you. We know, Lord, that it's you that work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. So often we just let ourselves get in the way. and We do not serve you as we ought to. Help each one of us in here, Lord, to have the foundation of Jesus Christ, knowing him as our Savior, and let us build thereon gold, silver, and precious stones. Let us labor lovingly, willingly, unselfishly, and faithfully. And may we hear one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing together. 128 in your book, if you have that. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. Felicia and Xavier, why don't you go to the back door so folks can shake your hand as they've come out and uh, wish you the best as you head on your journey, okay? We'll be praying for you. Keep us updated, okay, on what's going on. All right, they'll go back there. Let's sing together. 128, the windows of heaven. Here we go. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy too. God bless you. You are dismissed.